I'm with Tony Kevin now, who's the former Australian ambassador to Cambodia and Poland and former diplomat for Australia in Moscow for decades. Tony, you have been following the situation in Ukraine very closely. Now, most recently, you appeared on Crosstalk, and the issue was this missile that had landed in Poland. Now, I've just heard more recently that Scott Ritter seems to have said that it couldn't have been an accident, which is what you thought that it was most likely. I agreed at the time, but Scott Ritter gave some pretty precise reasons why it may not have been an accident, even though there was a comedy of errors after that in relating what had actually happened. But he said that there was no way that a bomb could have hit Poland, a ballistic missile, without there being a target painted in the sky. So what do you think about that? And is that a real problem that there may be uh, some kind of issue in the chain of communications between Zelensky and his army? Have they both got the same intent? Yes, I heard the Scott Ritter interview, and it was very interesting, as Scott always is very interesting. I don't know that it's necessary to this um, analysing this very important event to be absolutely 100% sure whether the missile was aimed at Poland or was some kind of a technical misfiring or malfunction that resulted in the Ukrainian missile landing in Poland. I'm not enough of a technical expert to make a good judgment on that. What I can say as a former diplomat is that in the end, I think the more interesting aspect of all this is not whether it was a deliberate attempt to involve Poland in the war, and if it was, whether that was at the level of Zelensky or the level of some renegade, more junior group in the chain of command running down to the, the missile launching team. To me, the more interesting angle is what happened in the hours immediately following. And let me preface that by saying that I agree with Scott and others that the United States and NATO would have been tracking every missile in the sky while this was going on, every Russian missile and every Ukrainian anti-aircraft missile. So they would have known in very real time, immediately, in fact, that there was a Ukrainian missile for whatever reason flying into Poland. They would have known that. So they would have been ready for the Polish complaint that, hey, two people have been killed and we want to invoke Article 5 as a NATO member, or at the very least, Article 4, that we all have to consult about this threat to peace. But both very dangerous developments. And so what's really interesting and, and I think encouraging is that Biden very quickly sat on this, very quickly quashed it. And he quashed it in two stages. First, he said, well, I have no evidence that, that this was a Russian missile. And then he left a couple of hours for that to sink in. And he came up with a further statement that um, I believe it was a Ukrainian anti-aircraft missile that finished up in Poland. So from that point on, Biden was hauling NATO into line, including the East European NATO members, Poland and the Baltic states, who were, frankly speaking, practically ready to start World War III on the spot but he very firmly pulled them into line. And I believe that he would have done that on the advice, not of anybody in State Department, but because they tend to be hawks in State Department, always have been, but on the advice of either the Defense Department, General Milley, the Chief of Staff, or Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, or indeed Nicholas Burns, the head of the CIA, both of whom, uh, Burns and Sullivan, have very recently been in hotline talks with their Russian opposite numbers about the subject of preventing nuclear war by accident. So I would think it's very likely that both of them would have advised Biden very strongly, this is not believable, and don't be sucked in by you know, people who don't necessarily have a responsible attitude to these questions, kill it very quickly. So Biden killed it very quickly. And then we get to the second interesting part of the story. 
which I'm sure you're about to ask me a question on, which is what about Zelensky? Why, why did he go on saying that he believed it was not a Ukrainian missile? And uh, that's an interesting question too, because Zelensky pushed that to the point where NATO officials were openly becoming irritated with him. And it's reported in the Western press that they were saying that, look, Zelensky's losing his credibility with us if he goes on like this. That was in the Financial Times. Yes. And so we're in a situation now where Biden has very firmly headed off Article 4 or Article 5 responses to this missile. Mm. Zelensky has said, hey, hang on, you shouldn't be doing this. This is a serious complaint I'm making. And Biden and the rest of NATO simply overruled Zelensky. Now, this leaves Zelensky's reputation very damaged, very damaged indeed. Mm. And it also, I think, sends a very important signal to Kiev, to the Ukraine leadership generally, don't try again to broaden the war outside beyond Ukraine because uh, we're going to cast a very beady eye over whatever you claim. So this is really, in the end, very good news for Russia because it means that the war is being contained to Ukraine rather safely. And it means that Russia, which I believe has the advantage on the ground, which can only increase in coming weeks, Russia's in a very good position now to win this war. And Ukraine has much less opportunity to broaden it beyond Ukraine. Tony, there has been a lot of talk about negotiation. And maybe this is a good sign, what you're saying, that the brakes were put on Zelensky's and companies triggering of Article 5. But is it a good time? Do you think the Russians will think it is a good time to negotiate? Well, in the crosstalk discussion that I had with Gilbert Doctorow and Jim Jatras, the view of my two fellow panellists was very much that Russia should not be losing its military momentum to enter into negotiations, essentially because the Americans and Zelensky cannot be trusted that they'll simply use the pause in fighting to reinforce their position, which will just lead to more loss of lives of uh, Ukrainian young men. And so they argued quite strongly that Russia needs to continue to push forward uh, with its present strategies until it has achieved a complete military victory. But aren't these breaks a sign there should be some level of trust? the breaks that were put on what you could call the false flag failure, according to Ritter. Um, isn't the breaks being put on that narrative mm. an indication mm. that there should be some level of trust on the part of Russia, that there is goodwill there to not escalate, but rather negotiate? Is that not a sign that Russia should take? Well, Russia's formal position, formal position is that they are ready to negotiate any time Kiev is ready to negotiate seriously. Russia's mm. never closed the door on negotiations. But the tone coming through from Russian comments, and I read a lot of Russian editorial comment on Telegram, which has a lot of Russian sites on it, the tone is that very much as Jim Jatras and Gilbert Doctorow were saying, that Russia should not be taken in by Western honeyed words, <laughs> that it'll just oh, yes, be another trick. I've heard plenty of that. I've heard plenty of that, but at it'll least... It'll just be another been, trick. Yeah, I suppose the rationale was that the West might just want to bide for time. Perfidious yes. Albion, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, hoping something better might turn up, that, you know, Putin might die or something. something might happen. And, yeah, uh, or they have time to regroup. Time to regroup, uh, but they haven't got much to regroup with. Exactly. Um, they've lost most of their men, most of their equipment. Their their energy is disappearing fast down the plug hole. Yeah. And um, Ukraine is going to cease to be a viable industrial state relatively soon, within a matter of weeks, if not days, uh, as this Russian bombardment of infrastructure, military strategic infrastructure continues. Because you see, when you bomb an electricity substation because it's important in the war effort, you're also, as, a, as collateral damage, if you like, 
making life in Ukrainian cities impossible because mm. without water, without sewerage, without light, without power, people living in high-rise buildings can't survive. I thought that it was mainly so that you couldn't transport weapons via train lines because they, the trains were electric, weren't they? Well, that's true. And, and yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> cutting, cutting the supply lines to the front is a very important part of the, of the yeah. ob objective. But the side effect is that cities become unlivable. And yeah. I don't think that's beyond the Russians to, to figure that, well, hey, that might bring on a regime change more quickly. Something might happen I to, see. End, to end this war. Yeah, but it's a bad time to be turning off the power on ordinary people. What temperature did you say it was in Lviv? Minus seven in Yeah, in, in well, this is terrible. Night. This is terrible. Unfortunately, this is the nature of modern warfare and has been since World War II. It didn't stop Hitler making war on civilians during the Blitz in the UK, and it mm. didn't stop the British Bomber Command uh, making war on Russian cities in the later stages of the war. Yeah. Um, this stuff happens in war. The only difference is, and I will make this point firmly, that Russia continues to go to enormous effort to avoid collateral civilian deaths in their bombing raids. They're, they're incredibly well targeted. And believe yeah. me, if there were a lot of deaths from these bombing raids, the Ukrainian government propaganda organization would be wheeling them out for us all to see. We'd have lined up bodies by the hundred. Well, it but wouldn't we be propaganda. It would be the truth. It right? would be the truth. And, but we haven't got them. And, and that means that right. the Russians are doing what they say they're doing, which is very precisely targeting their strikes. They can strike to within a meter. They can pinpoint a target to within a meter. I do they understand can, that, but cutting off the power is indirect harm. But we should hear some reports of people freezing to death soon, shouldn't we? No, I hope we don't because people... I hope we don't as well. Because people have a survival instinct and people yeah. have already been encouraged by municipal leaders like the mayor of Kiev, mm -hmm. um, Klitschko. He's encouraging people who can to leave the city. He says if you've got a safe, warm place in the countryside where you can keep warm and, you know, live on local stored food and collect firewood in the forest, leave Kiev now. So that this is, is the same glitch that Victoria Newland wanted on the outside back in 2014, is that right? Or probably end of 2013? It could be. It could be. <laughs> I'm not sure. He's a bit of a rough, a bit of a roughie. I He's know, a former, I know. A former yeah, prize fighter, but he does seem to have the common touch. Yeah, that's the one. That's yeah. the one. He was supposed to control the mob, and now he's telling them to take shelter. Now, you see... Wherever they can. Oh, how helpful is that? You see, going back to 1812 in Moscow, the Russian high command instructed the people to leave Moscow. So um, just in the same way as Surovikin encouraged the people of Kherson City to leave yeah. Kherson City. Yeah, yeah. And, and Klitsch, Klitschko is advising the people of Kiev to leave Kiev. So look, there's a bit of a Russian pattern here. People, when things get tough, retreat to the countryside and they survive. Well, one would hope, but the population of Kiev might be quite large and I don't imagine that they're particularly financial and if their railways are down, their mobility is likely reduced. Um, well, we hope that things will sort themselves out, but do you anticipate that there may be, in this panic season, perhaps, in the time coming up to the arrival of the 200,000 troops, that there may be some other false flag or foolish actions happening? There's not a lot that can happen now because now that the Russians have withdrawn from Kherson City and they've withdrawn from the eastern bank that they hold to a safe distance from the river, even if the Ukrainians blew up the dam at Kharkovka, it would simply run down the channel, help safely to the sea. It wouldn't kill anybody. Yeah. Mm. It would do a lot of damage, of course, to property, but it wouldn't kill anybody because there's nobody left in that river valley now, just depopulated. Well, I was thinking more about a similar kind of problem, like an attack on a NATO country. I think that the problem now is that Kiev lost credibility. 
So, yeah, they can't try for Article 5 again very easily, right? Not very easily. Yeah. I think Russia's holding all the cards at the moment. Yeah. And winter's coming and the ground is freezing. And it's all working quite well for them because as the ground freezes up, they're completing their training and their equipping of the um, 200,000 conscripts and 80,000 volunteers, 280,000 people, whom Scott mm. Ritter's always talking about. And 60,000 of those people have already been absorbed into divisions on the front line. They've just joined depleted divisions to bring them up to strength. And the other 220,000, if my arithmetic's correct, are still in the rear areas of Russia, not well, quite close to Ukraine, I would suggest, undergoing final training, final equipping, getting ready to go in as complete divisions. Mm. And um, that will transform the war because once the ground's frozen hard, Russian tanks and Russian mobile artillery vehicles can move very fast indeed across the frozen ground. And they're not confined to the roads because the frozen ground means they can go anywhere. And that means that the Ukrainians really have no resistance. It'll be like a, a hot knife going through butter if Russia decides to go forward. Now, the first thing that Russia will do, I believe, the first thing is recover the one quarter to one third, I'm not sure of the exact percentage, of Donetsk province mm. that is still in Ukrainian hands. They, they will want to get back to the original borders of, of Donetsk province and of Lugansk province, where they almost have 99% now. Mm. So once they've got those two provinces intact, then the question for them is, do they talk to Ukraine about peace, if Ukraine's ready to talk about peace, or do they go forward? And if they go forward, where do they go forward? They've got a, over a thousand kilometre long battlefront to choose from. And my guess is, for what it's worth, they'll aim somewhere in the south because they'll want to somehow finish up with Odessa. They can't go through Kherson now because Kherson's, A, there's no bridge there. Mm. And Kherson's going to be pretty well defended. It'll be like... Yeah like the um, the Azovs in Mariupol, they'll defend Kherson to the last to the last death, to the last mm. breath. So they'll they'll go around somewhere to the north. They might go across the river in the Kharkovka area, the area of the hydroelectric power station. There's still apparently a functioning bridge there. Or they might go even further north. I mean there's there's anywhere where they can cross the river really, as yeah. long as they concentrate their forces sufficiently. And then they just keep going west or west southwest uh, until they hit the um, the border of uh, Transnistria and then they've got Odessa bottled up and then they take Odessa and I think Odessa would fall into their hands like ripe fruit because the people of Odessa are, are so fed up with this war I understand. Well yeah it could get quite nasty in Odessa if that is basically the end game the last stage before checkmate because it means so much to Ukraine. If it loses Odessa at the end, it's going to be landlocked, right? And it's going to change everything in terms of their economic potential. But on the other hand, the people who live in Odessa, it's, it's traditionally a Russian-speaking city, isn't it? Yeah, well, Odessa is like Mariupol on a larger scale. I mean, Mariupol was occupied by the Azov Battalion for eight and a half years after it unsuccessfully tried to join Donetsk and Lugansk in, in, in setting up their independent state, the Azov Battalion was too strong and it drove them back. And essentially they ran Odessa like a colony for the next eight and a half years. Now, of course, it's a very different situation now. You've got the whole Russian army pressing down on you. I think Odessa wouldn't be too hard enough to crack because Whatever Ukrainian forces are there, whatever Azov battalion or extreme nationalist forces are there, they will know that the population would like to see them gone. Exactly. And so I, I don't think they'd hold. I think they'd cut and run once they realised that it was militarily untenable. So, I mean, from my point of view, it, it, the war is going very much Russia's way. Yeah. And I, I can't see Ukraine finding a way out of a Kiev finding a way out of this. 
Mm. I, I'm starting to talk about the Kiev regime because, <laughs> I mean, it's getting harder and harder to talk about the government of Ukraine because this is a government that basically, and I'm I'm echoing Gilbert Doctor on this, that, that this is a government that basically doesn't care about the people of Ukraine. That they care about their own survival. They care about their ideological program. They don't care about the people of Ukraine. No, and certainly Zelensky is wealthy enough to be able to beam himself out of there at any given moment. Yeah. Tony, Kevin, thank you very much for updating us on what's going on there in Ukraine. Thank you. It's always a pleasure.